BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the show. First, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone who listened to the debunking episode that came out over the weekend. On the weekends, I've been doing a segment where I try to debunk Zodiac Killer suspects whom I think absolutely were not the Zodiac Killer. And I've been going through the material around the serial killer, BTK Dennis Rader, and there is indeed a Zodiac Killer D BTK connection. And... I thought that one tied in very nicely to the debunking series, but as you can see from the title of this episode, today I'm going to be talking about how the serial killer Dennis Rader was portrayed on film, and I've talked to you guys very frequently about this. I find it fascinating to watch things like true crime documentaries or listen to podcasts, and sometimes even reading the books, and then compare those to the dramatizations that are put out on film, and I watched three different movies that were either depicting BTK or featuring a character that was directly based on him. And the first was BTK from 2008, and then there was The Clove Hitch Killer, which um, is available on Netflix now, and that came out in 2018. And then the final one that I watched was A Good Marriage, which is based on the writings of Stephen King. Um, he wrote something by that name, but definitely, absolutely based on BTK. BTK's real name is Dennis Rader, a real-life serial killer who, at the time of this recording, is 77 years old, serving life without the possibility of parole. BTK stood for Bind, Torture, and Kill. He was convicted for 10 murders, and was definitely a sexual sadist, someone whom, by his own admission, said that he was acting out sexual fantasies that became murderous. And how exactly would you portray somebody like that on film? To talk about the movies in the order that I watched them, the first one was called Simply BTK from 2008. I saw it on Tubi, and it features the horror legend Kane Hodder playing BTK, um, you might remember him from the Friday the 13th films. He did a handful of those playing Jason Voorhees. He also did the Hatchet movies playing Victor Crowley. And he is no stranger to serial killer films. Um, he did Ed Gain, The Butcher of Plainfield. And at some point on this channel, I hope to do an episode on Ed Gain to talk about him, as well as the dramatizations and how he has been incorporated into other fictional characters. This film, though, if you ever get a chance to watch it, again, I saw it on Tubi for free, they wanted to show that BTK was going after all types of victims. He was someone who could murder men, women, children. He was a home invader. He was very stealthy. And 
on the debunking video, I even said that there was a line that just sounded so much like the Zodiac Killer. He holds up a man and woman at gunpoint, and he says, all I want is your money, and it was so reminiscent of the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa stabbing, and I absolutely do not believe that they were the same person, and I talked about that in the debunking episode. But I think that that just goes to show that BTK's primary motive was to dominate, was to murder, to obtain power, and to have some type of sexual thrill kill that was associated with power. And he had urges that he was chasing after. Kane Hodder, though, as a lead actor, was someone who could definitely pull off the intimidating factor. And um, compared to some of the other actors who were playing um, either BTK or a serial killer inspired by him. And I think that the BTK from 2008 film really showed how somebody like a serial killer can just be all calm and collected at one point and just be polite and come across as just a friendly good Samaritan, a good member of the community, and then all of a sudden when they're talking to somebody else, it's like a different personality has taken over. And that is something about serial killers that I think is not shared enough in the media about the way personalities can change or that the way that they are actively choosing to show different sides of their personas to other people. But the one criticism that I think this BTK film really, that I really have to give for it is, I think they really downplayed the concept of Factor X because there is one line in the movie, pretty much, just one line saying, there's this monster living inside my brain that is driving me to kill called Factor X. Maybe that's two or three lines put together and I just turned it into one line, but they could have done so much more with that if they're actually trying to do a biopic on Dennis Rader. Because it's just that. I mean, that's what it was described. And I swear, when I first learned that that's what BTK called this uh, thing inside his brain, I, I thought that I had learned it incorrectly. I had to check and then double check because I was like, no, I'm just confusing it with the show X Factor. But no, indeed, he called it Factor X. And I always compare real-life serial killers to fictional serial killers, because sometimes the fictional serial killers are very good at illustrating certain points. And the show Dexter talked about this a lot, based on the novels by Jeff Lindsay. If you ever read those novels, though, I think that the books are better than the TV show. I know everybody says that all the time, right? But no, I really do believe that. I loved reading the Jeff Lindsay novels about the fictional serial killer Dexter when I was back in college. But he would call it the Dark Passenger. And I think that that is, again, a very good illustration because it's about how there's this other, more sinister persona who is living in him. Just as BTK said, there is another person inside my brain who is the monster trying to take over. And um, the Kane Hodder film from 2008 also talked about how at one point in his life, BTK, Dennis Rader, wanted to fight the urges. He had urges to kill, a sexually motivated serial killer. And he wasn't someone who was just cold, methodical, and calculating because he wanted to see if that he, if he could do it. He wasn't someone who was just a taunting serial killer who's going to come up with things like codes because he wants to see if he can get away with it or that he can outsmart everyone. These were sexually motivated, done for his own sexual gratification. And that is very important to incorporate into the storyline because that that is a completely different psychological profile compared to somebody who simply wants to act like they're someone who can weave their way around the laws of society and not get caught. No, this is a sexually motivated serial killer. And he also gave himself the name Bind, Torture, and Kill. And long-time BBOR listeners will remember when I did an episode once talking about the podcast The First Degree, and they said that there's a special place in hell for someone who gives themselves their own nickname, and they're referring specifically to serial killers. Also, the Zodiac Killer was incorporated in that discussion, but BTK came up with this. And um, a big, though, the big feature of this film with Kane Hodder 
was that they really showed how BTK wanted to get caught. They're openly talking about that. He wanted to get caught so he could show off his uh, criminal exploits, and he doesn't seem to fight it once he knows that the doom is impending. And uh, somebody even left a comment on the first episode that I did about BTK here on this channel where he thought that he could impress people even though he was a gruesome, sickening serial killer. And that aspect of it was captured on the um, in the Kane Hodder film. But I do want to go back to the point about Factor X for a second. If they're actually going to just have one sentence in there, or two or three, that there's this thing in my brain that's driving me to kill called Factor X and I can't fight it, they could have done so much more with that. Show his descent into madness, or him trying to resist um, the urges, or how exactly would this process take over when Factor X would control him. And I would have loved to have um, seen that played out on film. And the final point of criticism, and I don't really do this too frequently on Black Box All Night Radio, I mostly just talk about the true stories, but the final point of criticism is that if you ever watched this movie BTK from 2008, it has very lengthy kill scenes, very elongated kill scenes where he'll be strangling a woman, and more than a minute goes by while he's strangling her to completion, even to the point where I spaced out while I was watching it, and then I looked up again, it's like, oh, huh? And he's still strangling the same woman, and I'm sure they were trying to show some type of realistic effect, what would it be like if BTK actually strangled a woman? But it was a little bit um, difficult to watch because it's so um, overly um, overly done, and it it really allows the the viewer to be distracted or become easily distracted, and it's a little bit unnecessary because we can get the point much more easily, but um, I don't really give uh, film criticisms too much. However, I might start doing that in the future for some things with television, not with movies, but with television and some of the true crime programs that are out there. Okay, so the second film that I watched that has a character based on BTK was called The Clove Hitch Killer, and that one featured Dylan McDermott playing the serial killer slash father, and this was a fictional serial killer inspired by BTK called the Clove Hitch Killer, and quite similar to the real-life Dennis Rader, he was a member of his church, he was the leader of a Boy Scout troop, but he was uh, different in some basic uh, background aspects. He was from Kentucky, as opposed to Kansas or anywhere in the Midwest, and that film is set in Kentucky. His name is not Dennis Rader in that movie. It is Donald Burnside. This version um, of a serial killer, the Clove Hitch Killer, did not have two daughters. Instead, he had one daughter and one son. And if you ever watch the Clove Hitch Killer, it's a little bit different than the very simple biopic or serial killer examination film. Instead, it's about a boy who suspects his father of being a serial killer and what happens and um, the events that take place and he becomes somewhat of an investigator or a sleuth himself. Now, I like Dylan McDermott. I like almost everything that he has done. The one exception that of a movie with Dylan McDermott that I do not like that much is Olympus Has Fallen. I watched all of those movies. Gerard Butler plays the lead character. Yeah, he's great in them. They're good action films. But in the first movie, uh, Dylan McDermott plays one of the supporting characters, and I absolutely did not like his character in that film. Other than that, it's great. Um, Olympus Has Fallen also has uh, Morgan Freeman and... Um, Rick Yoon plays the villain in that one. So, with this one, though, I thought Dylan McDermott truly captured something about how a serial killer can come across as non-threatening. And he's having these heart-to-heart -heart conversations with his fictional son, and it sounded so authentic. And I know that actors are very much famed for having 
charismatic personalities, and it's their job to be convincing on film, and the ones who actually make it into the movies must be good at it at, to a certain extent. Either that, or they have some good uh, PR people or agents, or maybe there's just some hype around them. But when Dylan McDermott just trying to like reassure his son that everything is fine, it was just very convincing. It was a big transition, though, from watching some guy like Kane Hodder, who is this very physically um, intimidating and imposing figure, versus someone like Dylan McDermott, who seemed almost a little bit too clean-cut to be BTK, even though it's a fictional version of him called the Clove Hitch Killer. And I have to apologize to someone. I have to apologize to YouTube user Tina L, whom I corresponded with at length about the Jean Benet Ramsey case. And we were talking about the different knots that are used in the Boy Scouts, and we brought up the clove hitch. And I failed hard at my Eagle Scout knowledge. Yes, indeed, I am an Eagle Scout. But I talked about how a clove hitch is used to tie two pieces of wood together. And in fact, it is not. And they even show that in the film. It's, you start out with one. Now, when I was in the Scouts, we did use the clove hitch to, again, tie it to one piece of wood. And then you add on additional pieces of wood. It's called lashing. You do it to build outdoor structures and... Um, Anything that would require multiple pieces of wood tied together. Okay, I forgot uh, something. I only remembered half of it. I, you would say I misremembered. But I do apologize for getting something incorrect all the same. And, uh, you know, gotta beat myself a, up a little bit about that. But I do take it back. I'm actually just remembering something in The Clove Hitch Killer. They are not called the Boy Scouts. They're called the Rangers. But um, they're named after the uh, local area in Kentucky where they were in. But that uh, detail isn't too important. This um, movie, The Clove Hitch Killer, wanted, again, to show the sexual sadism aspect. It also had the concept of serial killers breaking into people's homes and just tells them, I only want your money or I only want your car keys. They had a scene about where the serial killer says, I only want your car keys in the... Um, in the uh, Clovefish Killer, also reminiscent of the Zodiac Killer at Lake Berryessa, but um, it is just telling somebody a lie to put them in a false sense of ease, or they think that the tragedy is going to be over soon, or that this person is just going to take what they want and leave, and that they are not going to murder them. I think the movie uh, The Clovefish Killer brought up something about serial killers that was also very underreported in the media, and that is the heightened predatory instincts, or that they're just more aware of their surroundings than other people. And all the BTK films that I watched had that type of that type of um persona because you see this so clearly in the Clovefish Killer, no matter what this boy does when he's investigating his father, he can't hide it. His father always figures out what's going on. He can see through him. He can just understand that his son is going into his secret hiding places and that um, he is always just coming up with these explanations. And it's um, it really just goes to show that he's mostly one step ahead of the game and always using his instincts at almost um, a heightened and supra-human level. And there is um, one scene, not to give away too many spoilers, but when the boy finds out that his father has pornographic magazines and pictures of women, of women in bondage, uh, uh, what would be the exact word? Because that, that's not really clothing. I guess you would call it bondage equipment. He blames it on his brother and said, Hey, look, I was into that stuff, but my brother was into that way worse than I was, and those were his. This was not me. And this is not a spoiler, because I think that the movie The Clove Hitch Killer really could have had an excellent twist at the end. My suspicion is that they wanted to make a BTK movie, but they didn't want it to be about the real-life BTK, they wanted to add in some fictitious elements. Like I said, he has a son instead of a daughter. But um, they could have done such a big twist at the end about how there was um, 
some type of, uh, I don't know, an identical twin brother who was separated at birth, and then he was the actual killer. And yeah, that is quite similar to uh, some of the things in Dexter. Again, the books, not the movie. But uh, anyway, I think that um, the Clovish Killer also really did a very good job on how the final victims of the serial killer are the family members. And it really showed about, they had this husband and father who was very supportive, who was a very good member of the community, and the family had no idea about these destructive actions that he was committing. And that also goes to show you that there's this complete misconception of how serial killers are just lonely people who spend all of their time alone, and they think about killing people. No, it's quite to the contrary, because even the real-life BTK was married, he had children, and he was the president of his church. He was a scout leader. He hardly spent all of his time alone. But this film really showed about how that the fake life that he was living, or that aspect of his life that he was living where he was the father and family man, was just removed. And then the family was just left with this very, very uh, large hole in their family structure. And the family, in some ways, became the final victims of the serial killer, even though they weren't murdered, but their lives were heavily damaged. And the final film that I watched over the weekend about BTK was Stephen King's A Good Marriage. I saw this one on Pluto TV, and all the films that I've uh, talked about are easy to find. Um, Tubi and Pluto TV are free, though. Netflix, though, you need the subscription. But with this one, Anthony LaPaglia plays the uh, variant of BTK, and he is referred to as BD. I first, I absolutely did not like that. There's a reason why he calls himself that, but it, the name of the serial killer is BD, B-E-A-D-I-E. And this one, again, features a sexual sadist who is married, he has two children, and he is not ba on the real BTK, or he's not named after the real BTK. Again, it's not set in the Midwest. This one was actually set in New England, and he was working as an accountant. It was definitely, I think, more of an upper-class family than the real-life BTK. And excuse me, he is based on the real BTK. I misspoke earlier, but um, just has a different name. His name is actually Bob Anderson in the movie um, A Good Marriage. And it really focuses on how the wife would respond if she learned that her um, husband was indeed a serial killer like BTK who would attack people and bind and torture them. And if I recall from watching this movie, I think that the uh, BD killer was someone who went after mostly women, whereas... Uh, Dennis Rader definitely had male victims and definitely would kill people who would go or would get in his way, so to speak. Now, this movie also zoned in on the heightened predatory instincts as well as having a very strong memory. And I don't even think it's too much of a spoiler, but the uh, wife in this movie uh, discovers a secret hiding place and she accidentally leaves... Um, a box containing his serial killer trophies and items a little bit too far to the left, and she only puts one rubber band around it instead of two, and he remembers all these details. He knows that um, she has been there. I don't want to use this expression, but it's the only one I can think of, that the cat is out of the bag. And she. it's more about how does the wife respond now that she has learned that her husband was a serial killer and again, I said I didn't like the name BD for, um, well, any serial killer. And I part of me thought that, did Stephen King give him this name? Because it sounds like BTK if you say it super fast. Not just really fast like BDK, but if you were to say it like really, really fast at ultrasonic speed, then BD sounds like BTK. And it could very well be, but there is a specific reason why the serial killer is called that in the movie. I don't like to give away spoilers, but I think that... This movie did a very good job of talking about the different persona or that Factor X concept. It's not called Factor X in a good marriage. Instead, he just says that 
I'm not the one who's actually doing these killings. There's this voice in my head. There's this different person who takes over. And that's absolutely no excuse. And of course, it's not true. But this is some type of major psychological problem that the serial killer would have. And then he, um, in the movie, he reassures his wife by saying that, well, he is in control of that and he would never let it hurt her. But I mean, if it's an urge that he can't fight and can't resist, I mean, that is hardly in conjunction. So um, you can watch the movie and make your own uh, interpretations. But uh, I think that um, obviously that was just a BS thing that he was saying to uh, keep her under his control. And um, I thought that the first movie that I recommended um, was BTK from 2008 was absolutely the fastest movie very fast-moving film, and I thought about that when I was watching the other two, that they were a little bit slow-moving. I mean, with the uh, BTK from 2008, I didn't think that it was the most gripping or most exciting movie, and I said it had those elongated kill scenes, but I paused it once, and an hour had gone by, and I was like, whoa, wow, you know, it felt like 25 minutes, but an hour was already done. Very, very, um, very, very fast-paced film, and the movie, The Clovehitch Killer, starts out kind of slow. It's two hours long. The first hour is just kind of like, well, okay, these are just people living in this small town in Kentucky. And then the second hour really sped up, and that was that was very good. And um, A Good Marriage had, let's just say, lots of surprises in it. Um, so there are lots of twists and turns in that storyline. But... Um, there's also a request uh, from Rosie, who wrote into the uh, comment section asking, will you talk about the influences from BTK on the novel and movie Red Dragon, the novel by Thomas Harris, and that features Hannibal Lecter as a um, fictional serial killer? And that was uh, something that was posted on Wikipedia, that the novel Red Dragon was inspired by BTK. And it's not referring to Hannibal Lecter, it's referring to a fictional serial killer named Francis Dolerhide. And what I said in the first episode that I did on BTK, where I responded to his confession that is online on YouTube for free, which anyone can watch, is that Red Dragon is the only Thomas Harris novel that, that I have read. I mean, I saw Hannibal... Si the Silence of the Lambs, and um, not a uh, Hannibal series, but um, what is it, Claire Reese on CBS, but the only novel that I've read is Red Dragon. It's been about, I actually had to go back and think, it's been 17 years uh, since I've read that one, maybe 18 years, so I'm a little bit rusty on it, but I do remember that it featured a very sadistic serial killer, this Francis Dolerhide character. He's also obsessed with um, a particular painting by William Blake, the Great Red Dragon and the Woman Clothed in the Sun, and just going off of memory on that one. And he talks about, I guess, how um, the dragon is uh, driving him to uh, kill, or that uh, he's just using that as like... Um, something that allows to, to, it takes over, and then he goes after people based on um, his own sadism. But I believe that the character in Red Dragon was much more um, of a masticating serial killer. Like, I remember there was one scene where he bit a man on the lips and then ripped them off. If BTK did, ever did anything like that, I was not aware of it. But they made a movie about um, the book Red Dragon, and it's called, I always I always mess it up, it's called Manhunter, right? Not Mindhunter. But that was like the um, first movie that was based on one of uh, Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter novels. And then everything was overshadowed by The Silence of the Lambs, which is an excellent film. I mean, absolutely excellent. And the show Claire Reese on CBS is a continuation from The Silence of the Lambs, but they don't focus in on anything related to Hannibal Lecter. And it's only about Clarice and the Buffalo Bill storyline and the other people who were involved. But um, not about um, Hannibal Lecter per se. But now it's time for a fun fact. Hannibal Lecter is actually a Lithuanian-American. Have you ever heard that before? I read that online once. 
But out of the films I've been talking about, I absolutely recommend BTK from 2008 the most because when I watch a serial killer film that's based on a true story, I just want to get straight to the heart of the issue and I want to see how they would choose to depict this person on film. I've also talked about um, a lot of the other movies out there such as The uh, Stranger Beside Me or they did one about simply called Ted Bundy. Both of those are about the same serial killer. If you ever get a chance to watch the movie Ted Bundy, it features a lot of up close and personal details of an execution like from a prisoner on death row that they don't talk about in a lot of other movies. I've also responded to um, the movies uh, Dahmer and My Friend Dahmer based on the book by Durf Backdurf about uh, Jeffrey Dahmer as a serial killer. And um, there are also some episodes here on this channel talking about John Wayne Gacy and um, the film Gacy of that name, Dear Mr. Gacy, and uh, the movie To Catch a Killer. Because let's not pretend that these people are not terrible. They are very bad individuals. They commit heinous actions. They are deranged, mentally ill. And I, that should go without saying, but I don't think it's emphasized enough because some people simply want to say that they are monstrous. And I do not find that to be a convincing explanation. If somebody like BTK is going to talk about how there is this evil monster that can take over his brain, that by definition is deranged. Or even the fact that he has the urges to kill people at all. Absolutely, that is some type of psychiatric malfunctioning going on. Or I should have said perhaps that it is a disorder, that there some way, somehow, there is some type of neurological component, genetic component, or neurochemical issue with this person. And not only are they mentally ill, but they're also acting on their destructive tendencies. And I will have to do something larger in the future where I'm talking about something beyond serial killers depicted on film because I always go back to this, but it is representing something different about humanity. I think when we watch these movies about serial killers, it's not to glorify the killer, but instead it represents a very dark and violent nature that... um is very much present within humanity, but we don't talk about it all the time. Because as I was spending the weekend watching these movies about serial killers, I was just thinking about how there are so many other types of murderers, like whether it's someone who is connected to the drug trade, like the drug cartels even, or how about even just the gangs, no matter if they're inner city gangs or if they're some type, again, of criminal enterprise gang, they murder people as well. And a lot of it relates to some people who believe that they will not get caught or they're trying to cover up the destructive actions that they've committed, the illegal actions that they've committed. They want to murder somebody to silence them. But I think that these um, tendencies go well beyond just someone who is a deranged serial killer. And again, I believe that a lot of people are experiencing this dark and violent nature um, of humanity, this very, um, very sadistic or even opportunistic side when some people think that they, if they commit murder, they will not get caught or they will not get away with it. And if there are not consequences for their actions that they care about, people will do unimaginable things. I really believe that there is no limit to human sadism at that point. So I guess that what I'm trying to say is, I believe that the destructive tendencies experienced by serial killers are actually much more prevalent than we originally thought. And this is what I said in the episode that I did responding to BTK's confession when I said that what truly shocked me was how many serial killers were out there. It's not just the famous ones that you can probably think of off the top of your, of your head. There are so many more who not only murder people, but unlike the gangs and unlike the drug cartels, murder is the primary objective and there is a cooling off period. Unlike the mass shooters, they aren't just killing a large amount of people at one time. They are very, very much collected and able to plan and organize 
and they're trying to, again, use murder as the primary objective. And that's bad. Absolutely, that's bad. And make no mistake, I do not like any of the serial killers. Even if I watched an entertaining movie about a serial killer, it's just because I wanted to see how actors and directors and the production team would recreate this uh, real-life event. And if we are just going to turn a blind eye to that dark and violent side of humanity that I was just talking about, then that would be horribly inappropriate just to say, no, I'm not going to pay attention to that. People haven't been paying attention to that type of behavior for years. And where did it get us? It just allows people to lurk in the shadows and prey on the unsuspecting. So that's why I watch serial killer documentaries. That's why I watch movies that depict serial killers. They aren't the stars of the show. No, absolutely not. They are people who deserve to be incarcerated, and we can learn things from them after they've been incarcerated in hopes that crimes like these will not happen again in the future. All right, well, thank you for listening to this entire episode, if you've made it all the way to the end, where I talk about BTK depicted on film, as well as that rant about um, just serial killers and their uh, behavior in general. Thank you so much for listening one more time, and anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. There's also a page for the show, Black Box Online Radio. Feel free to have a look at some of the links, the book, Killer on a White Horse, the Teespring page, t-shirts, coffee mugs, uh, hooded sweatshirts, and um, Rep Sports. You can visit that uh, page there. Have a look at some of their products. Use the coupon code NED075 and get some discounts. And I will see you over on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.